seated. <clears throat> Thank you for being here today. We, uh, I'm, I, we are really excited about launching tribes. This year, I think, is going to be, um, or this uh, se- tribe semester, the spring semester of 23, I think is going to be especially awesome. I know that many of you uh, are, are new, or we've had a lot of new uh, members join the church recently, and this is going to be an amazing opportunity to get into people's lives, into their houses, uh, to eat meals together. And, uh, and really just be able to connect in a meaningful way. So uh, next week, make sure that you come. My hope, if, if you're gonna be a tribe leader, uh, my hope is that you will make it, it's been a dream of mine to see our tribes get more creative than just like, we meet on Tuesdays and we talk about the Bible, you know? Uh, I wanna hear people that are like, we got a skydiving tribe and we're gonna go out and like, we're gonna train every week and we'll talk about the word and then at the end of the semester, we're all gonna go skydiving together, you know, or... We've got a, w, a classic WWF. Y'all remember when it was an F instead of an E? <laughs> Lucas, of course, you know. <laughs> you know, we got a classic WWF tribe. We get together and we talk about, you know, The Undertaker. And then, uh, and then we study God's word. It's awesome. Like my, my hope is that we would have like tribes that, are, that have more flavor than just when we get together and all pretend to be, you know, on fire for the Lord one, day, one night a week. My hope is that we can like start to really share interests and share passions and hobbies and, um, and that we can grow together as a family in that sort of way. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I would not sign up for either one of those tribes that I just described. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably rather jump out of a plane than have to talk about the old WWF. Um, it is good to see you. My family is uh, out of town this weekend. They send their regards my, uh, my two oldest sons are at football camp, and uh, so they're outside playing football in the freezing rain right now in North Carolina, so I'm glad that I'm in here. It feels, it feels good. If you have uh, been here for the last few weeks, the last couple months, uh, I've been talking a lot about our core values as a church. Uh, now, this is, this is interesting to me because uh, Pastor Zach, maybe six months ago or so, he said, you know, there's a few messages that I think are, are central to sort of what make us as a church unique. He talked about uh, peace and, and what it means for us to be in, inheritors of the, the age of peace. And we'll talk about that, I think, in a few weeks. And, um, and he talked about uh, the, the names of God and how sometimes we'll use Yahweh uh, or Yeshua instead of God or Jesus and why that's important to us. You know, that would be a thing that makes us as a church or as a local expression uh, unique. Uh, And one of the things on his list of of things that he could identify that he thinks set us apart is the way that that we approach honor in this house. And, uh, And so today I get the incredible privilege of being able to teach on our next core value, which is honor. Now, Honor is the key that unlocks anointing. And I'll, I'll teach you this in God's word. And I was talking with Pastor Ian earlier today and I said, you know, my biggest struggle in trying to preach a message on honor is that I'm only able to preach one message about honor. Because, because if I'm honest, I probably could stand up here today and just go for the next 10 or 12 hours talking about why honor is so critical to the culture of the kingdom. You know, if you've been around for any length of time at all, you have heard me talk about the kingdom a lot. And if there's one thing that maybe I haven't spent an entire message on that I, I always sort of assumed would go without saying when I talk about the kingdom, it's, it's this. It is a kingdom. It's not a democracy. In the kingdom, there is a king. And you have the option to either honor the king or to rebel against him. There is no in-between. You don't get to vote about whether you agree with the king's decision or not. He didn't ask for your permission or your agreement or your endorsement. And in fact, because we, uh, most of us at least, were born and raised in a a, a democratic uh, culture, now, we may, we may acknowledge with our mouths that we recognize that we, we now are, we've been adopted into a kingdom. And, and so 
Uh, that may be something that we affirm intellectually, but the truth is that many times I've seen in churches, and unfortunately a couple times even in this church, that when people don't like the things the king is doing, they, they go in, around and they get other people to sign their petition of offense. You know, I'm upset because this happened, and I, I don't like that this is, and I think the church doesn't do enough events for ladies, and I think the church doesn't pray enough, and we need to do more casting out of demons in services, and we need to worship for shorter because it takes too long, you know? And, and there's, people have their opinions about what ought to be happening, and um, since they're not the king, they're not in the position to make that decision, and so what they do is they go and try to get support for their idea, you know? They bring around their little clipboard, and they're like, hey, are you offended with Pastor Matty too? Are you... Do you not? Do you also, uh, you know, not like the way that we worship? And think that the PA is too loud in services, and so we should turn it down. Do you not like the lighting? I think that we need to keep the temperature in the sanctuary lower. We need to change the carpet, right? Whatever your agenda is, you sort of approach it like a, a uh, uh, someone who was born and raised in a, in a democracy. And the problem with that is that the kingdom is not a democracy; it's a kingdom. And there's a king that presides over it. And so before we get into honor, we have to recognize that, uh, that we are not talking about honor when we feel like it, when it suits us, when it's convenient or comfortable or even beneficial. We are talking about honor because we recognize that the king is the king. And, and, and we can either submit to him or rebel against him and it is eternally significant that we choose the, the former. Amen? Amen. And so uh, I want to just read this paragraph that I've written about honor, and then I'll go through it. And we're going to jump around a lot today. If you are up in the booth, I don't know who it is today. I'm sure you're incredibly gifted and, and anointed. We're going to be on a journey together today from the front of the Bible to the back and everywhere in between. It's going to be good. Um, and so here's what, here's what we, we have. We believe it is a sacred privilege to be counted among God's people. God, I could preach for hours on that. We do believe it is a sacred privilege to be counted among God's people. We recognize that God is glorified by the way we honor those he put into our lives. So whether it is by giving well-deserved double honor to those who oversee the church giving honor to the governing authorities of our land or by honoring all men. We are committed to conducting ourselves with great honor, both in our daily affairs and in our posture toward the church as God's institution in the earth. All right. We believe it is a sacred privilege to be counted among God's people. See, if, if I could put my finger on the, the one thing, God, I, I'm cautious to say this, but I, it's, I, it's right and it freaks me out. I, I've never thought this thought before, but if I could put my finger on the one thing that I think keeps the American church out of inheriting all that God has for us, it is the fact that we fail to honor the sacred position we have as members of, of God's family. I think that we, we look at church like it's a country club, like we got a gym membership for our soul, right? And you can come in, you know, you come in heavy at the beginning of the year because it's new year, new you, right? But then you have one late Saturday night and it's like, eh, I'm not going tomorrow, you know, it's no big deal. A tribe, I mean, now I've got to go to church another time a week, like our lives are busy, we're not really interested in doing that. Men's prayer, you know, I'm supposed to come here at seven in the morning on Sunday. Oh, you know, I, I come on. I've got a, a new baby. There's no way that I could that I could possibly manage that, right? And what happens is, is like with the church, just like with the gym, we find excuses and we, you know, and it shows. <laughs> Maybe not in the shape of our body when it comes to the way we approach church, but it certainly shows in the shape of our soul, in the shape of our character, yeah, probably in the shape of our marriage, the shape of our children, and uh and so it shows, right? I think that if I could put my finger on the one thing that keeps the Western church out of all God intended for her to have, 
It would be our, our inability or unwillingness to honor the privilege we've been given to be here. Because the truth is, there was a time in your life when you would have given anything to not be in church on a Sunday morning, right? The truth is that there are billions of people who do not have a body of believers where they can come together to openly worship God and study his word. There's billions of people today who don't even have the ability to do that thing that's just a mild inconvenience for you once or twice a week. And so it's, this is no small statement to say we believe it is a sacred privilege to be counted among God's people. It is a sacred privilege. And if we will honor that privilege, we will discover the rewards that that privilege affords us. Now, I should say this up front. One of my favorite books ever written about honor is, is by a good friend of our family and ministry named John Bevere, an amazing man of God, a great, a great author and teacher of the word. Uh, if you want to learn more about this after I'm done teaching today, if you think that I'm off my rocker and there's no way that anybody else could agree with the things I'm going to say, you should read John Bevere's book, Honor's Reward. Um, it's, it goes a lot more in depth than I'm going to be able to in the next 45 minutes. And so I would encourage you to read that book. If you're even remotely interested to, to read John Bevere's book, Honor's Reward, it's a fantastic book. And some of the things I covered today um, are points that he also makes in that book. Now, we believe it is a sacred privilege to be counted among God's people. Now, I want to go, <clears throat> I want to go to Mark chapter six. I'm going to compare and contrast Mark chapter six. And if you guys are able to work ahead up there, uh, Mark chapter six and Matthew chapter 15, that's where we're going to go. Mark chapter six, verses one through five. It says this, then when he, that is Jesus, went out from there and came to his own country, that's Nazareth, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? So Jesus shows up in Nazareth and there's a different type of authority on his life. There's a, tip, a different type of dominion that he's walking in, and they want to know where he got this. See, <clears throat> see, that's the, the thing, right, is, is that these people knew Jesus, and I'll get into this in just a minute, and so they, they're thinking it, it certainly couldn't have come from him. He can't be the source of this power. Certainly he got this somewhere. He learned this. Where did he go that he learned this? They ask uh, in, verse, in verse two, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Verse three says this, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were what? So they were offended at him. Is this not the carpenter? Listen, you've got to understand, Jesus, he has a reputation in Nazareth. People know him there. These people, they're not just people that are, you know, faithfully religious and they're offended because he's upending their religious tendencies. He's not challenging their theologies. The issue that they have with him is not actually what he's teaching or doing. The issue that they have with him is who, who is it that's doing the teaching? Who is it that's performing the miracles? The issue they have with him is that they've known him for 30 years. Those that are older in the community, they remember the scandal about when Mary had a baby before she and Joseph were married. Y'all remember that, right? And they kept swearing up and down it was God's baby. Okay. <laughs> whatever, you, whatever you say, Mary. You know, they remember the drama when he was little. I'm sure they remember when Joseph took the family and fled to Egypt to avoid the, the persecution and the, the edict that had gone out for the execution of the babies in their day. And so, and so they know Jesus. They don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They don't know Jesus as the promised Messiah. They know Jesus as the carpenter. Can you imagine, can you imagine people who just had like a professional relationship with Jesus? Like, you know, honey, did you, did you know they crucified our carpenter? Like, the, the table's not even done yet, right? <laughs> 
be a weird thing. So, <laughs> so, they, so they don't know him as a, a, a prophet, a teacher. They don't know him as master or Lord or savior. They don't know him as the, the anointed one sent by the father to deliver Israel from captivity. He is known as the carpenter. This is the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. We know his brothers. His sisters are here with us. We know his mom. We know his dad. This is, this is just a, a kid that grew up in our city. He's nothing special. He's insignificant. And so they, they, they see him not for who he is, but they, they recognize the reputation that he has not as being one that is significant or special or impressive in any way. They see him as common. They see him as common. And so when Jesus comes and he brings his divinity with him and instead of responding with eager anticipation, instead of responding with faith and desperation to say, Jesus, we want what you have to offer, they're offended at him. Uh, how many of you know that, uh, that sometimes God will send exactly what you need through the person you least expect to receive it from? <laughs> God will give you what you need in a package that you don't really want. That's what, uh, honestly, when, when we planted this church, I was... My biggest fear was that our church was going to be full of a bunch of like tattooed hardcore kids. And uh, we've got a few of them, you know, and we love them very much. We're so glad that you're here. That's why I'm so happy to see more and more silver haired men and women in the church. Like we need you. And I'm so grateful that you guys are able to see that sometimes God might give you what you need in a package that you didn't want. <laughs> right? Listen, I wish I didn't have a neck tattoo too, right? But, <laughs> They don't wash off, so you got to just love it, right? You got to lean into it, <laughs> and uh, and this is what this is what Jesus does with the the Nazarenes in this story is He sends them exactly what they need in a package they didn't really want. This is just Jesus. He's been around for thirty years. He's no big deal. He's unimpressive and insignificant in every way. And so instead of responding with the appropriate awe and wonder and submission to His supreme authority, they are offended. They're offended at him. And now, this is the, uh, I think the lesson that all of us ought to take from the story is that, is, is that the offense we hold in our hearts can be the, the wall between us and the gift God is trying to give us through the life of the person we're offended at. If you are offended at someone in this church, you should. Get over it. Amen. Here's the deal. And I, listen, I get it. And you feel like you want to come and talk to me about it. Uh, you should know. I don't want to hear about it. I love you. And here's why. Here's why. You want to come and talk to me about it to figure out who was wrong. They were wrong or, or maybe you're wrong. And... And here's the message. It actually doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter who was in the wrong. If, if they actually did wrong by you, if they sinned against you, you should forgive them. If they had pure intentions and were maybe just clumsy and, and accidentally stepped on your proverbial toes and you're offended with them, you should forgive them too, right? Right? And so it doesn't really matter who was at fault. What matters is that if there's an offense in you, it's your responsibility. And it may not have been your choice. It certainly would not have been your preference. But if it's in you, if the offense is in you, it's your responsibility. And so if we're gonna be people of honor, we have to be people that are willing to take our offenses and lay them down at the foot of the cross. If anyone has ever in history had the right to be offended it is the innocent, spotless lamb of God hanging on the cross for my sins, sins he did not commit, right? And so we come again to the cross and we say, I'm glad to know a little bit more, Jesus, of what you went through. You were betrayed by those closest to you. You were insulted, you were attacked, you were diminished. 
And you were rejected by the people that should have loved you the most. And so when I'm hurt by my church family, Jesus, I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to know you a little bit better today, right? To get to see things through your eyes a little bit clearer today. This is uh, a prerequisite to us becoming a, a, a community that really does honor well. We've got to be a community that really does forgiveness well. Amen? We've got to be a community that gives each other grace for our, for our humanity because not one of us has grown beyond it. Amen? And so, and so what we see in, Matt, in, in Mark chapter 6 is that Jesus comes to the city. Jesus in the flesh, the, the miracle worker, the, the Lord of heaven and earth, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He walks into Nazareth and these people see him and they treat him as common. And so instead of eagerly receiving the gifts he came to, gave them, uh, to give them, the deliverance that he could have uh, established and ordained for them, the healing that he could have performed, they're offended at him. The Bible says in, in Mark 6, uh, verse three, it says, is, is, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is, without, is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Jesus recognizes that he as, a, as a, a, a prophet, as a spiritual authority, is despised not by the strangers that he ministers to all around the known world at, at his time, but he's, a, he's despised by the people that knew him best. What a tragedy this is. It's, it's been an interesting thing for me over these last three or four years since we started this ministry, to, sit, to watch as people come in and they're blown away at the fruit of the ministry. They're blown away at the presence of God that's so evident every time we gather together. They want to be a part of what God is doing here. They're eager and excited and, and, and fascinated and they wanna jump in immediately and how can I serve and how can I give and how can I partner and how can I pray for you, pastor? And then, and then they, they get close enough to... To, to me, or they get close enough to our staff, or they get close enough to the church that they realize, oh, it's just a bunch of people. <laughs> yeah, surprise. <laughs> and they get offended at us. Like they spend time, like the, the Nazarenes had done with Jesus for 30 years. They spent time with him. And so it didn't really matter what he did. He was just a person. He was just a guy. He, this is a carpenter. His mom lives down the street from me. His brother still owes me money from a bet he lost a couple years ago. It's like, I know him. He's not anything special, right? And, and so the, we see this in our lives as, as well. It's, it, I have a unique perspective because people come here and I'm the pastor of a, a great church and they think it's because I'm a great leader. And the truth is I'm just winging it, man. I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do tomorrow. I'm gonna have to wake up and say, okay, God, what now, right? Where do we, where do we go? For, I don't have some like secret leadership strategy that nobody knows about that has caused our church to be so successful. It's just, we just keep putting Jesus as the center of attention and, and that seems to work out pretty good. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep doing that, you know? And, and, uh, and so people, they get close to me and, and sometimes you, I find that they uh, get real unimpressed. <laughs> and here's the difficult thing for me to, to be the one to have to say. Because they get real unimpressed, they begin to withhold honor. And because they withhold honor, they actually close the door to the blessing that God could have brought them through my life and leadership for them. And, and the, the interesting thing is, it's actually not me that was gonna give them the blessing. It was God that was going to give them the blessing for the way that they honored me. The, here's, here's the thing. It, it's not, what I'm saying is not, if you honor, then the people you honor are gonna be good to you. Uh, no, that's not always the case. In fact, that's not even most of the time the case. I'm saying if you honor, God will bless you for your honor. It's the honor that unlocks the anointing, way more than it's my teaching or, or leadership in your life. I'm, gonna, I'm doing my best, but the truth is it is honor that unlocks the anointing, way, than it, way more than it is my teaching or influence or investment into your life. So, so we've looked now at, at, at Mark 6, verse 4. Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country, that is to say, except where he is familiar, among his own relatives and in his own house. Verse five says this, now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Now, 
the, uh, the Amplified Bible expounds on this as it says, he was not able to do any mighty works there. This messes with my theology. And if I'm honest with you, I don't really know what to make of it. But I know this, that if Jesus Christ himself, the second person of the Godhead, the sovereign God in the flesh, if he himself was not able to do mighty works because people who should have honored him were offended with him, then I think it stands to reason that we're gonna have trouble ministering if the people who are supposed to honor us are offended with us. That we will have trouble receiving from Jesus or from the leaders that Jesus has put in our life if we uh, bring offense instead of honor. If we bring criticism instead of honor. And so... And so we see that these people, Jesus leaves the city, he goes elsewhere. People get their miracles, they get their breakthroughs, they get their deliverances, they get their salvation. But he goes through Nazareth, a couple people get healed and he's, the Bible says that he marveled at their unbelief. He was amazed at their struggle to honor him just because he'd been familiar to them. And so I, I wanna contrast this story of a group of Nazarenes who did not receive what God intended for them. I want to contrast this with the story out of Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15 verse 22 is where I'll start. Matthew 15, 22, it says, and behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to, to him, that is Jesus, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. And he answered her, not a word. He answered her not a word. <clears throat> and his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. So I wanna give you some context here. Jesus is insistent through his entire earthly ministry that he came for the Jews. And, and thank God that Jesus then sent the apostle Paul to bring the message to the Gentiles. Thank God that in, the, in Cornelius' house, the Holy Spirit is poured out and Peter's eyes are open to, to God's plan for the whole earth, not just the redemption of the Jewish people. And so we're, we're grateful for this, that we as Gentiles are able to have access to salvation. But Jesus didn't come to preach to Gentiles. Jesus came to preach to the Jews, to bring miracles to the Jews. Jesus came to minister to the Jewish people. And so during his earthly ministry, this woman comes to him. She's a Gentile. She's from Canaan. And she pushes through the crowd. She finds out where he's at. She tracks him down. And she says that her, her daughter is severely demon-possessed. And Jesus ignores her entirely. He ignores her. You know, one of my favorite stories about honoring authority is a friend of mine, Mark, Casto. Uh, Mark is uh, uh, connected with a spiritual um, father of his, a good friend of our ministry, Damon Thompson. And, and uh, Mark would tell you this story. Mark's an, an amazing pastor down in Georgia now of a great and, and dynamic church. And uh, he was a, a big time minister in middle Tennessee and uh, was a, a part of a huge ministry there and was always on TBN, you know, he's getting fly, flown all over the world to preach at these big conferences and crusades. He's a, a big deal. He's making lots of money. Everybody wants him at their event. And uh, in the middle of this, the spirit of the Lord talks to Mark and says, you need a spiritual father. You need to submit to a father. And so, um, you know, that sort of word to somebody is uh, kind of ruins a lot of plans. And so Mark knows about Damon Thompson. He's out in South Carolina, out in the woods at this point. And he comes over to... South Carolina, and he has a conversation with Damon. And he says, here's the, the deal. You know, this is who I am. Here's all my credentials. I'm very impressive. And uh, maybe he didn't say it exactly like that, but that's what he meant. And, uh, uh, and he says, you know, I'm coming here to be a spiritual son to you, Damon. And Damon says, all right, sounds good. And Mark moves his family <laughs> to South Carolina, leaves his job in the ministry, 
start saying no to all these events, leaves his job in the ministry. He goes over to South Carolina, and uh, Damon does not talk to him at all for two full years. They have no conversation, not one. He doesn't, Damon doesn't respond to any of his calls or texts. He goes the other way. When he sees Mark coming, he like walks, Damon like walks the other way, like actively avoids this guy. It wasn't even that big of a church. It's not like it, it's, it would be a hard thing to not ever talk to somebody for two years. And so for two full years, and the interesting thing is Mark, you know, the, he starts by being offended like I would, like I'm sure many of you would as well. It's like, you know, what kind of father are you? You don't even talk to me, right? Like, what are you, what are you doing, right? And then and the months go by and Mark starts to think, man, did I mess up coming here? This is spiritual abuse. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Here's the issue. <sighs> Listen, spiritual abuse is vile. It is a horrible, awful evil. When, when pastors or spiritual leaders use their position of influence to manipulate or to belittle or to control people or, or to lead people into sin or compromise, God have mercy on them. Like the, the judgment that those teachers are gonna face is beyond description. I could stand here for the next 10,000 years and would never be able to adequately explain how horrible the, the, the recompense for those actions and, and misdeeds is going to be. I'm telling you, God will deal fiercely and harshly with spiritual leaders that abuse people that are under their care, okay? You've all heard me say that. Now that I've said it, half of what people call spiritual abuse is just accountability. That's the issue. Listen, I wanna be able to condemn spiritual abuse across the board, but everybody's so soft and selfish that anyone who tells them, hey, you should probably not divorce your spouse. They're like, it's spiritual abuse. He's controlling and manipulating me. I can't believe this pastor told me what I didn't wanna hear. It's like, shut up, man. You come to, listen, you came to church because you wanted to grow spiritually, you wanted accountability and direction in your life, and then you got it and you ran away. Boo-hoo. Like, here's, here's my issue. Listen, spiritual abuse is a, a serious and vile violation of God's order in the earth. But we've gotta be real about what spiritual abuse is. When someone tells you no, that's not spiritual abuse. So for two years, Damon doesn't talk to Mark. And, uh, and after the first six months, Mark is like, I'm getting abused, you know? This is rude, I can't believe he's doing it. Does he know who I am? I'm very impressive. Didn't, did he forget about my resume? All these other churches would kill to have me, but I'm here in the woods in South Carolina with you. And after maybe 12 months, Mark realizes that maybe he's not learning something he's supposed to be learning, you know? And so he asks himself a question, I think a healthy question. He asks himself this question, why is it that I need affirmation so badly? Why do I need Damon's stamp of approval? You know, I came here to be a son and I felt like I was gonna be in his house all the time. He's gonna be prophesying over me. I'm gonna be able to preach with him and travel with him when he goes out of town to minister. I thought I was gonna have this special place of favor with him and I don't have it, and I'm deeply offended. Why am I deeply offended? Because I don't have a position. I'm still loved by God, aren't I? And so after about 12 months, his heart begins to change, and he realizes, you know what? I think I had an unhealthy need, an unhealthy dependency on man's affirmation. And so over the course of the next 12 months, Mark's heart begins to soften, and he, he just begins to look for ways to serve, ways to pray for his leader. He looks for ways to contribute to the church or the community. He just, uh, he just settles into his seat. And it may not have been the seat that he dreamed of having. It may not have been comfortable or convenient uh, for him. It, it may not have been the prosperity that he thought he was gonna step into when he became a son. But what happened is that for the first time in his life, he got to the point where he was willing to say yes to God, even if it didn't lead to the applause of men. For the first time in his life, he was willing to preach the truth he became the kind of man that would preach the truth even if people didn't like it. For the first time in his life, he was set free from the need for acceptance. And so after two years or so, Damon calls him into the office and he says, hey, I'm going on a trip. I'd love to bring you with me. And they start spending time together. And Long story short, Mark is an amazing, powerful, anointed man of God. Damon has sent him out to lead a church in 
Georgia, he's doing a phenomenal job. Lives are being changed all over the place because of Mark Castro's ministry. And so um, I, I, I tell you the story because this woman is following Jesus. She's saying, my, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. I have got maybe the most troubling possible situation. Jesus, you're a miracle worker. You're a minister. You're moved by love. Everybody tells me that you love everyone and you take care of people. You perform miracles. And so here I am. I need a miracle. No one else can help me. Will you love me enough to do something? And Jesus ignores her. He ignores her. And so she's got the opportunity to be offended. And this is what she does. She ignores, uh, he, he ignores her. Verse 23 Matthew 15, but he answered her not a word and his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. But he said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he explains to his disciples, I'm not sent to her. My concern is not with her. I've got an assignment and my assignment is not her. She has no right or she has no claim to the the, the miracles that I came to give. And it says this in verse 25, Then she came and worshiped him. It doesn't say she came and begged him. She came and argued with him. She came and confronted him. She came and criticized him. It says she came and worshiped him. She answered his indifference with worship, not with offense. She had every right to be offended, but instead she she continued after him with honor in her heart and with a posture that communicated the honor that she had. She came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, I don't know how women in the first century acted, but I know that women in 2023 don't like it when you call them dogs. (laughs) And I'd be willing to bet that that's something that transcends time and space. Like I, I don't think there was ever a time that women liked that, you know? And so it's probably not a big leap to say that Jesus sort of doubles down on his offensiveness, that he at first was indifferent toward her, seemingly indifferent toward her. And then she responds to that with worship. And then he says, I came to put food on the plates of the children of Israel and it's not right for me to take it off their plate and throw it to you like a, a scrap for a dog. And now again, she had every right, she, she, or she had every opportunity to be offended She had every opportunity to be upset, deeply wounded, and to go off and talk to anyone who would listen to her about how, you know, they say Jesus is this loving minister, this awesome man of God, but he's not. I know firsthand. He doesn't love everybody because this is what he said to me. He called me a dog, right? I'm sure you guys have never heard anybody talk like that about a church they went to. This is is an interesting thing for me because people come here and they, they try to compliment me by telling me, you know, how bad their last church was. Oh, my last pastor, you know, he just, he always put God in a box and he didn't preach as good as you. And, you know, the worship here is just so free and I just love it. And it's like, it's only a matter of time until you're off at some other church talking crap about us, you know? (laughs) Can Can I give you a tip? This is true with any relationship. I would say like with dating as well. If you wanna, if you go on a date with someone and they start telling you all the things that their last partner did terrible, uh, that should be a red flag for you. Um, if someone comes into the church and they start telling you everything their last church did terrible, that should be, that's a red flag for me. It's not to say that we lie about the failures of people. Like I'm not saying that we should pretend like it was great when it wasn't great, uh, but it, it means that we have the opportunity, just like this woman did, we have the opportunity to, to honor or to to yield to offense. And so she, she chooses honor. Jesus, he ignores her at first and then he speaks to her, then he calls her a dog and, and uh, she, he says, it, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. See, she doesn't argue with him. She doesn't criticize him. She doesn't condemn him. She doesn't hold her to her Uh, hold him to her moral standard or what she thinks a leader ought to be or how a leader ought to talk. He says, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. But she says, she doubles down with her honor. She says, yes, Lord. Even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She's insistent in honor. 
She's not giving up. But she's not moving from the place of honor. Jesus, I honor you. I'm here to worship you. I believe that you're my only hope. You're the son of David. I see you for who you are. I honor and I honor you. And, uh, and she says, yes, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And so I, I want you to see this. Jesus is talking about his, his heavenly purpose and mission. He's saying, I came, uh, uh, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's why I'm here. That's what I'm doing, and I'm not doing anything else. He's talking about the sovereign will of his Father in heaven. And he says, you're not it. I don't have an assignment for you. I don't have a call for you. I don't have a grace to minister to you. I have nothing to offer you. But by the end of the story, her daughter is made well, and Jesus marvels at her faith. And so I, I wanna contrast these two stories. You have the Nazarenes, Jesus came into their city and he was trying to minister and he was not able to do so because they were offended at him because they treated him as common. And then you have this woman, this Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus and despite the fact that she's not, uh, she's not a descendant of Abraham, she doesn't have the, uh, the covenant promise of God. She, she has no claim to the grace of God that is being poured out through Jesus. She gets it anyway. And so I want you to see this. The Canaanite woman received from God something that she was not supposed to have access to, while the Nazarenes missed that which they had the most access to. The Canaanite woman received from God something she was not supposed to have. She received from God something she was not supposed to get, but the Nazarenes were supposed to get it, and they missed it altogether. Why? It's one word honor because she honored where they failed because she persisted in honor despite the fact that she had every opportunity not to she persisted in honor and the Nazarenes refused now there's another story I think that's really similar I'm, I'm trying to go fast I should be wrapping up right now and I'm just getting started uh, are you guys are you good this is going to be you're going to have some chances to be offended today this is good <laughs> Time for us to grow in honor. In Luke chapter five, I'm gonna go fast, starting in verse 17. In Luke five, it says, now it happened on a certain day that Jesus was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Who was the power of the Lord there to heal? Somebody say them. The, listen, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So who's in the room? Pharisees and teachers of the law. Pharisees and teachers of the law are sitting by. They've come from all these cities and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. What happens in this moment is that some people hear Jesus is there and they tear a hole in the roof of the, the, the building and they lower their paralyzed friend down through the hole in the, the building. And, uh, and then Jesus it says, when he saw their faith, in verse 20, when he saw their faith, Jesus said to him, man, your sins are forgiven. So you've got a room full of dozens or hundreds of, of religious leaders. The, the power of the Lord is there in the room to heal them, specifically. Nobody's getting healed, but the roof opens up, a man gets dropped in from the ceiling, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Verse 21, it says this, and the scribes and Pharisees began to reason. Ugh, oh, that's their first mistake. God doesn't fit inside reason. That doesn't mean God doesn't stand up to logic. It means that God doesn't fit inside of it. So they, they begin to reason. The scribes and the Pharisees, they began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? See, there were two conclusions they could have come to. Conclusion number one is that this man in front of us is blaspheming God by forgiving sins. Conclusion number two is that that man is God. See, they came to the wrong conclusion. Who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus perceived their thoughts. He answered them saying, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier, 
to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk. But that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took what he'd been lying on, departed to his own house, glorifying God. They were all amazed. They glorified God. They were filled with fear saying, we have seen strange things this day. Here's the problem. The power of God was not there to heal the crippled man they lowered in from the ceiling. The power of God was there to heal them, the scribes and the Pharisees. And none of the scribes and Pharisees got healed. Here's why, here's why. The scribes and the Pharisees were looking through the lens of their critical spirit, trying to find something wrong with him. This is, this is the hardest part about preaching to Americans. We've got a church full of Pharisees that are constantly looking at preachers through the lens of their critical spirit trying to find something wrong. And I'm very careful about what I say and how I say it here. And the reason I'm very careful about what I say and how I say it here is because I don't really want to hear from your critical spirit. But even if you give yourself enough time, you'll find something wrong with my leadership or my style or my theology or my church. But these people, they show up and they miss what was right in front of them all along. And what was right in front of them all along was that the power of the Lord was there to heal them. Jesus had come for them. He didn't come for the man they dropped in from the ceiling. He came for them. And they missed it. They they missed what the man who'd been dropped through the ceiling received. And the reason is, one word, honor. They failed to honor the one that was right in front of them. Are you feeling good? We are one sentence in. We believe it is a sacred privilege to be counted. (laughs) We believe, Lord, help me. We believe it is a sacred. This is what happens when my family's out of town. I don't have anything better to do but to write notes all week. (laughs) We believe it is a sacred privilege to be counted among God's people. We recognize that God is glorified by the way we honor those he put into our lives. Oh, yeah. God is glorified by the way we honor those he put into our lives. I want to go to Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to skip some things and we'll, we will be efficient today in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 10. Uh, so I'll read Matthew 10 verse 40. Jesus says this. <clears throat> he says, he who receives you, he's talking to his disciples. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me, he says, receives him who sent me. So he's speaking to his disciples and he's saying, if they receive you, they're receiving me because I'm sending you. And then if they receive me, they receive the one who sent me, the the father in heaven. So Jesus is saying, if they receive you, they receive the father. If they reject you, they reject the father. See, this is how it works. There's an if here. To receiving the Father. I can't, I don't have the right to say that I receive the Father, but I reject the authority the Father's tried to put in my life. I do not have the right to say, well, I receive the Father, but I reject the authority the Father has tried to put in my life. Jesus, he spells this out in Matthew 10, 40. He who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. The word receive is the Greek word uh, dekomai. It means to welcome or to accept in an eager way. Specifically, that word is used in reference to receiving salvation. It's what we do to salvation. And so you should understand that receive isn't like a passive thing. We could take the word honor and plug it in there. It is to, to, give, to put great value and weight on a thing and to eagerly pursue it or accept it. And so Jesus says, he who receives you receives me and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He says, he who receives a prophet In the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Now, there's a word that's repeated three times here. That word is the word reward. Now, this is a a beautiful point that John Bevere makes fantastically in his book, Honors Reward. There's a reason he uses that word reward here. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Now he talks about three types of people, prophets, righteous men, and little ones. Now, sometimes when I'm talking here, I'll say that, you know, God is going to use us to 
touch and transform our city, our nation, and our generation. Do you see the progression in the way that I say that, right? It's like we start small with our city and then it's bigger, you know, our nation, and then it's the biggest of all our generation, right? Uh, and, and I think that this is what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, he's saying there's really three types of people that I want you to, to learn to honor. Those are prophets, righteous men, and, and little ones. That is to say, those who are above you in rank, those who are beside you in rank, and those that are beneath you in rank. Here's the thing. Uh, it's hard to talk about honor without talking about rank. And the truth is that in the kingdom, not the democracy or the democratic republic of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, there is rank and file. It's like, it's not based on age or ethnicity. It's not based on your schooling or education. It's not even based on your experience. It's based on your passion for the things of God, where you, where you stand on the, the, on the journey of the pursuit of Christ. And, uh, and in fact, in the kingdom, the way that we move up in rank is that we move down in pride. That's a tweeter, Luke. There you go. <laughs> in fact, in the kingdom, the way we move up in rank is we move down and pride. And, uh, and so Jesus is talking about these different sort of levels, prophets, righteous men, and little ones. The prophets, those would be those that are above you in rank. That, that is like God's delegated authority. You know, God establishes Moses as a delegated authority. Now, God never makes the assertion that Moses is perfect. God never makes the assertion that Moses is the most compelling or capable leader. God never makes the assertion that Moses should be worshiped, but he puts Moses in authority and leadership. And so Korah uh, mounts a rebellion when they're in, in the wilderness. Korah gets some people together and they decide, you know what, Moses, we think you're prideful. We think that you are trying to sort of monopolize the leadership position and we think that you should delegate it to, to more of us. I mean, we're pretty capable as well. And, uh, and so we want a say in what happens to Israel from here on out. We wanna move away from this you know, delegated authority model that you've been operating under for all these years and we wanna, we wanna share the authority. We wanna share the load of leadership. And what happens to Korah is that the earth opens up and swallows him and his whole family into hell. God takes it very seriously. The Bible says that the sin of rebellion is as witchcraft to the Lord. Now, listen, I know that we're in a charismatic church, and so everybody gasps when I say the word witchcraft. It's like... <laughs> but, uh, uh, but when it comes to rebellion, see, some of the people that are most fiercely against witchcraft are some of the people that are most eager to lead a rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> you can tweet that too, yeah. Some of the people, <laughs> some of the people, yeah. Listen, uh, the sin of rebellion is as witchcraft for the Lord. Here's what I mean, rebellion. I don't. We're not talking about politics. Like I'm not. I'm not saying a rebellion. Like anybody's going to come and storm my office and mount a coup d'état against the authorities of our church. Like that's not. Here's what I mean when I say rebellion. I mean like gossip. I mean like slandering leaders. I mean like taking your offense with, the, the, with God's delegated authority in your life and trying to find other people that share that offense because it makes you feel justified in it. Instead of praying for your leaders, honoring the God that put those leaders in your life and continuing to contend for their success. Because listen, I may not have voted for Joe Biden, but... I'm very interested in his success. It would really be good for me if he did not start World War III. You know what I mean? Like, I'm saying I want him to succeed, right? So if there's any way I can help, I'm here to help, you know? It's like, man, I believe in, in that God has put him in that position. And so, like it or not, I've got to do what I can, which is not much beyond pray for him. I've got to do what I can to help make sure that he succeeds, right? I don't get to just... I'm not just going to say, well, I'm, whatever, I'm just moving to Canada. It's not, <laughs> not any better in Canada, right? <laughs> so we're like the last hope for freedom in, in the world. We, we, need to, we need to recognize that God puts authority in our life, that God puts authority in our life. 
God puts authority in our life. John, one of the things John Revere says is that there's four types of authority God will put in your life. There are civil authorities. Those are uh, elected officials, even down to local police officers, civil authorities. There are um, family authorities. Those are, if, uh, if you are a, a wife, that'd be your husband. If you're a child, that'd be your parents. We need to honor our parents, even if we're grown. Um, and then we have social authorities. Those would be people like coaches or teachers. And then we have spiritual authorities, and those would be pastors, or in this case, the word Jesus uses is, is, is prophet. So Jesus says, he who receives a prophet, in Matthew 10, 41, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question that sounds like it could be really complicated, and here's a hint, it's not as complicated as you think it is, okay? What is a prophet's reward? What's the kind of reward a prophet would give you? Oh, come on, Logan, great job, man. Prophecy, yeah, here's the thing. We make this stuff super, like, what does that mean? Jesus is speaking in mysteries. No, no, no. He, he's saying, like, if you fail to honor a prophet, you're not gonna receive what a prophet can do in your life. But what a prophet can do in your life, if you'll honor who God has made that person to be, if they're gonna bring that anointing to your doorstep, right? And so the, the, the reward a prophet gives you is gonna be his prophetic gift, right? Now, this is why, so I, I had a conversation when I first got joined to my spiritual father down in Mobile, Alabama. We, I'd been, I didn't know it, but I'd been looking for him for years. And we got connected in 2012. I was a, a, young, a youngish husband and a new father to my, uh, to my first son. And, and we were, I don't know if we were at that point expecting our second. Yeah, we were expecting our second uh, just a couple months into the pregnancy. And so we moved down to Mobile and we're trying to figure our lives out and, and, and I didn't know much about spiritual authority, but I knew it was really important to God. And so we had a conversation and, and he said, hey, I'm, I'm here, you know, we're gonna walk this thing out together. And I remember sitting in his office with tears in my eyes and I said, hey, I just want you to know I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in this relationship. I, like this isn't something that I take lightly. This isn't just talk. Time's gonna tell and it's okay. I know that I can't tell you where I'm gonna be in five or 10 years, but I'm telling you, I'm with you to the end. And uh and he said, okay, you know, that's very honorable. And he was gracious at, at my statement. And I said, and, and, and so because I'm in, I need you to be really careful about what you tell me to do because I'll do it. See, I don't get to hold him accountable, but I can remind him of how accountable he is to God for the way that he leads me. He's not accountable to me, but he is accountable for me. And so, I mean, I say it in seriousness that if he called me today and said, you need to get down to Mobile right now, I would be on the next flight to him. I'm so serious that if he said, you need to pass off your church to somebody else and you need to move back to Alabama to come and serve here, I would say, we're, we'll start house shopping. Or we'll put our house on the market. Like, we're coming. I mean, I submit. To, so, so all I can tell you is how I submit to authority. I'm convinced that this is a biblical approach. Uh, and it's a, it might be a weird thing for me to be the one to, to tell you this, but let's do it. We're talking about how do we honor prophets in the name of a prophet. Number one, uh, uh, I honor by praying for him. Number two, I honor him in my speech, not just my speech to him, my speech about him. Now, I'll say it like this. His name is Aaron Smith. Never once in my entire life have I ever called him by his first name. It's like, I just wouldn't do it. That's my... That's my apostle. It's like, I don't call my mom Betty. She would slap the taste out of my mouth if I tried, you know? <laughs> Heck no, we don't do that. <laughs> and so I honor him in the way that I speak to him for sure, but also in the way that I speak about him. You should know, believe me, there have been more than a couple times that I've had a good reason to be offended with him. Uh, and none of you would ever know it. None of you ever will. He, that is my spiritual father, the man that God has put to, to, to care for my, has put an authority to care for my soul. And I'm gonna make sure that my speech about him is speech that, uh, that highlights and magnifies his strengths and that covers over any, any shortcomings that I may see in his life. And so I, I honor him in the way that I pray for him and the way that I speak to him and about him. I submit to his leadership. And that's when I told him, like, you better be careful about what you tell me to do because I will do it. Like, it's, just, it's a serious thing. So I submit to him. Uh, number, number four is I give to him. 
it is in my best interest that he never has to worry about money. Can, I wanna make sure we're just talking candid here. It is in my best interest that I'm not asking him to pray for the spiritual well-being and direction of my family while he's also driving for Uber trying to make ends meet, right? And so I give to him, direct, not to an institution, I give to him because it's in my best interest that he never has to worry about how he's gonna pay his bills or make his mortgage payment this month so that he never has to worry about how he's gonna put gas in his car if gas prices increase or how he's gonna pay the, uh, uh, the, 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 the car payment every month. Like I have to do what I can, which isn't much in the grand scheme of things, but he's raised up thankfully more people than just me. So I, I pray for him. I, I speak well about him and to him. Uh, I submit to his leadership. I give to him and to his family and I serve whatever God has put in his heart. And here's what, here's what I mean by that. Like there were, I don't know how many times I would be off at some crusade or playing a concert somewhere and I'd fly home from like, we just finished playing, you know, to 30,000 people in, at Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado. And, we, and I like fly home right after that. And he's, he says, hey man, we're gonna be uh, trimming hedges at the church today. You wanna come by and help? It's like, I'm... I'm way too cool to be trimming hedges at the church, you know? And, uh, and I'm, also, I'm also way too aware of my own propensity to get caught up in my own coolness to say no. So yeah, I'm there. Let's trim some hedges, right? And so that's what we do. We trim hedges and, and we show up. And, and, uh, and so sometimes his dream is he wants the hedges to look better. So there I am. I'm, I'm happy to serve. Sometimes his dream is they wanted to build, uh, this is a, a, a long story for another time. They wanted to build a... Uh, a uh, giant computer, an eight foot by eight foot sphere uh, computer that they were building for this. <laughs> he, so he, he owns a technology research and development company on the side of, of having been in ministry for 30 plus years. Uh, this company has developed some of the most advanced technology in the history of the world. It's, it's uh, post quantum computing. So people are beginning to crack the quantum thing. This is beyond that by miles. Uh, they own seven patents and counting. They're really, really changing the world. They're, they're, they've created some, uh, some computer technology that is just unhackable and that is in many ways uh, world changing and, and I think can and, will, can and will open the doors to a lot of positive potential for the future in our world. And I'm, I'm really excited about it. Isn't that right? Josh worked for them for a long time. Now, there were times that I was uh, uh, like home from tour and I'm helping them, you know, burn circuit boards, solder stuff. I'm carrying things around, sitting in the offices. I don't know anything about any of that. I could barely describe it as you could hear, <laughs> let, let alone build it. But I was there, right? It was, it was a vision. And so the way that I honor spiritual authority in my life is, is I pray for him, I speak well to him and, and about him. I submit to his leadership or to the boundaries that he puts in my life. I give and I serve his vision. That's a good message. This, <laughs> that is a good message. And, and here's why, because 1 Timothy 5.17 says that those who lead in the church are worthy of double honor. Because I recognize that they're not just caring about my fine. I'm thankful that I've got an accountant that cares for my finances and a lawyer that cares to make sure that we cross our T's and dot our I's and I don't go to jail for forgetting to file something I should have filed. I'm thankful that I have those people. But there is only one person that God's put in my life to look after my soul. And honestly, I could go broke and I could go to jail, but if I have my soul still intact, I'm okay. Amen. Right, but it will not profit a man to gain the whole world. Maybe my CPA and my lawyer are killing it, but if I lose my soul, I've lost way more than anything in finance or legalities could ever could ever replace, amen? amen. And, so, uh, and so God talks about prophets. Those, are, those that are above us in rank, he talks about righteous men, those that are beside us in rank, and he talks about little ones. Now I'm gonna go to Luke chapter nine. We are going so slow today. <laughs> are you happy? <laughs> it's just, y'all just, listen, if you need to leave, then bless you, we'll see you next week. I'd rather you leave happy than stay mad, you know? I don't need you out there fuming, scrunching your face up at me while I'm trying to preach it. So if you gotta go, we bless you, we love you. <laughs> Luke chapter nine, 
verses 46 through 48, Luke 9. Okay, Luke 9, starting in verse 46, it says, Then a dispute arose among the disciples as to which of them would be greatest. That's a great way to demonstrate that you just don't get it. If you're disputing, I can't think of anything more fundamentally opposed to the culture of the kingdom, that these brothers are disputing about who's gonna be the greatest. That is in every way uh, antithetical to the reality of the kingdom. And so a dispute arose among them uh, as to which would be the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child, and they set him by him. See, uh, the, the mistake that these guys made in verse 46 is that, is that they thought that pursuing greatness is what was going to uh, position them for greatness. See, what they don't understand is that in the kingdom, it's been said by many people before me, that in the kingdom, down is the way up. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the servant of all. And what it means for us as, as believers to, to grow in Christ likeness or to move up the heavenly ladder is for, for us to move down the social ladder. To see ourselves as the least important person in the room and to understand that God has called us not to dominate, to manipulate, to control, or to impress. God has called us to serve. And so these guys are failing to honor the righteous men that are right next to them. So you've got the, the, the prophet, Jesus says, whoever receives a prophet for the sake of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever receives a righteous man for the sake of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. So these men are in a company of righteous men. They're with their brothers, guys that have been walking with Jesus their whole life. And instead of honoring each other, lifting each other up, mutually submitting to and celebrating one another, they're arguing with each other to see who's gonna be the best. They're failing to honor the righteous men that are next to them. And so Jesus brings the little ones into the picture. Verse 47, Jesus perceiving the thought of their heart, he took a little child and set him by him. And he said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me, uh, sorry, and, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you Uh, whoever is least among you all will be great. Now, does that sound familiar to you at all? Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Does that sound familiar? Does it sound a little bit like what we read in, uh, gosh, where were we? We've been around Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus said, he who receives you to his disciples receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me, Matthew ten forty. Jesus brings his child. He says, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. See, so Jesus is, is saying like, if you fail to honor even the least significant, even the least important, even the least impressive, even the least accomplished among you, if you fail to honor them, you're cutting off your lifeline to me because honor has always been the key that unlocks anointing. And it's, it's not just me saying that if I honor Zach, he'll, he'll keep leading worship at our church, right? It, 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 to me, it's like if I honor Zach, God is going to bless me with revelation. He's going to open up my world because of the way that I posture my heart toward, toward Pastor Zach. I'm gonna continue to honor him. I'm gonna continue to esteem him in the way that I speak to him, in the way that I speak about him. I'm gonna affirm God's word over his life. Even though I'm in authority over him, I recognize he may be one of my little ones, and I'm, th I'm so thankful to have, I'm so thankful that he's in my life, but I'm gonna continue to honor him because if I receive him, then I receive Jesus who sent him into my life. And if I receive Jesus who sent him into my life, then I receive the father who sent Jesus into the earth. But if I won't receive him, then I don't have access to the father. And so this thing of honor is very important. Matthew 10, 41 and 42, Jesus says, that we are to honor a prophet for the sake of a prophet. And if we do so, we'll receive a prophet's reward. If we honor a righteous man for the sake of a righteous man, we'll receive a righteous man's reward. And then uh, verse 42, it says, and whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his, what? He will by no means lose his reward. So I want you to understand, friends, that honor, we don't just honor for the sake of honor, we honor 
because we understand that there is a great reward for people who will say yes to cultivating a culture of honor in their community. We honor because it's how we were made to live. And here, I feel like I should say this about spiritual leadership. Um, We don't honor people because of their behavior. We honor them because of their position. We don't honor people because of that. We don't honor, not all behavior from leaders is honorable, right? I I think about the story of David and Saul. Saul has lost his mind. He's possessed by a demon and he's trying to kill David. David has the opportunity to kill him and he resists the urge. He just cuts a corner off his garment and then later David tears his clothes and he weeps and confesses, who am I to lift a hand against the Lord's anointed? I should never have even entertained the thought of removing someone from a position of authority that God has put them in. That's not to say that Saul's actions were righteous or justified, but it is to say that God put him in that position. And so we honor the position. It's not to say that we always agree with our president's character or choices, but it is to say that God put them in that position. So we, we will honor that position, continue to esteem and affirm the man or woman that God puts in that position. We will continue to honor because we will be people of honor. Because we believe that it is a sacred privilege to be counted among God's people. We recognize that God is glorified by the way we honor those he has put into our lives. So whether it is by giving well-deserved double honor to those who oversee the church, by giving honor to the governing authorities of our land, or by honoring all men, we are committed to conducting ourselves with great honor, both in our daily affairs and in our posture toward the church as God's institution in the earth. Friends, the the point that I made at the beginning of the message this morning is that I think if I could put my finger on the one thing that has kept the American church out of inheriting all that Jesus died for us to have, it has been that we have failed to honor how sacred a thing it is to be a part of the church. We, we really do believe and affirm that the church is God's institution in the earth, that God has ordained and established the church to be a conduit through which his presence and power is poured out into our our world and our generation. And for us to treat that like a, a, a common thing, for us to treat that like it's an insignificant or unimportant thing, is a great insult to the God who established this institution and is still today using it to transform the world in advance, righteousness, peace, and joy and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Father, teach us to honor. God, above all, teach us to honor you. Teach us to honor you, God. Teach us to honor those that you've put in our life above us, those that you've put in our life next to us, those that you've put in our life below us, God. We pray that whether the person we're speaking to is significant or, or insignificant according to society standards, that you, would, that you would put honor in our hearts for them. God, put reverence in our hearts for the church as an institution. God, we thank you that you have brought us to a house of honor here. We we pray that you would teach us every day what honor looks like in practice. Teach us every day to speak with great honor to those that are around us, to conduct ourselves with great honor, whether it's with people that we're in covenant relationship with, our spouses, or our children, or even if it's with the, the waiter or the waitress at a restaurant, God. Let us be people that honor everyone we meet. And as we do so, God, we pray that you would let the light of your kingdom pierce the darkness of this this world. Manifest yourself. Pour out your heart in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are we good? Good. Guys, I love you. Thank you so, so much for being here. Blessings to you. Blessings to you. And uh, we will see you. Or just a reminder, tomorrow from 9 to 2, the sanctuary is going to be open. You can come the whole time. You can stop in on your lunch hour or, or for just a little bit in the morning, whenever is convenient for you from 9 to 2. This space will be opened and, and uh, consecrated to prayer. Blessings to you. Love you all very much. And we will see you Wednesday night. Father was waiting to say with open arms.